the internet is working today, it's just working very slowly after the holiday. Okay, now, Mike, we're going to have a little conversation to start this off because our topic today is not something that a lot of people are familiar with. Are you familiar with the busyness crisis? Have you ever heard that? The busyness crisis, I've heard it. Why don't you educate me on what it is? All right, well, here's the thing. Uh, it was back in the 80s, all of a sudden, a lot of dentists, and I'm saying it was dentists before all the other professions, were freaking out because they felt like the dental schools are graduating too many students. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the market is becoming glutted. Now, as you probably know, I've been working with a lot of other professions, too. I worked for the, uh, well, I'll just say it was a National Veterinary Association, the National Optometric Association, lots and lots of component and constituent societies, not just in dentistry, but in lots of other things, and uh, urgent care and, and such. And, you know, it was funny because there was like a rolling thunder in the 80s. All of a sudden, everybody was going, we're having too many competitors and it's the fault of the profession because we're licensing too many people. Now, it also is happening. A lot of people were foreign trained professionals who were coming into the United States and not really taking jobs as much as they were taking slots and serving a lot of people. And everybody was very concerned. We have too many professionals for population. Now, I was working for the California Dental Association as their marketing manager, and I was consulting for lots of other associations at the time. And that's because I have a rather unique background. I am a, uh, a true demographer, and I, I happen to have sufficient math to really do calculations that everybody kind of wanted to know about. The question came back, is, how, do you, how does a doctor know if there's room for one more within an area? And so they came up with the idea that there's got to be a ratio that shows what the threshold optimi, uh, an optimum threshold should be in order to say, can we have another doctor or practice in this area? I did a lot of research on it. I, I did calculations because fortunate, believe it or not, organized dentistry had a lot of data and we had a lot of ability to talk to a lot of doctors and get their help. So... I started asking questions and doing this research, and here's what we found. There is no optimum number. Now, there was an average number that we found throughout different places within the United States, and we looked at the ratios of doctors to patients or to potential patients within all these different states throughout the United States. Now, Mike, you think it's important, don't you, that everybody knows what the ratio is? Sure. That's one of the first things everybody wants to know. That, that's right. But here's my question. How do you know if there is room for one more? Now, you may know what the ratio is, but does that really say that another practice is or is not viable? Mm. The question is, no, they didn't know this. Now, I had a conversation with some very smart people during the weekend, and I found something that kind of shocked me. There are numbers that are put out for each profession in which they will say, this is what the threshold is. It's just kind of mutually understood. We all know this. And they would say, if you have this many, then there's room for one more, fewer or more, whatever. It would make that determination. So I started asking around, how did you know that? How did, where'd you get that number? And you know what they were saying to me? We got it from you, Scott. Yeah, I was going to say, got it from you. What? I've written articles for uh, dental economics, for example, in the uh, lots and lots of organizations about the idea of busyness. How many is too many and how many is enough? And I've done this kind of work in different uh, associations for different professions to say, how many is too many and how many is enough? And here's what I found. They're quoting me. And what's kind of funny is a couple of facts need to be shared about this. And I'm gonna share this in three parts. One of the things that I, I kind of have said in this is, guys, if there is room for one more, how do you know? And it came down to a couple of little facts. And I'm going to kind of review this in a PowerPoint, so, and I'll make it very, very plain. I'm not going to do a lot of illustrations. Here's the fact. You don't know if there's room for one more because the population that you're trying to serve is not generic. 
So if every single consumer of dentistry or optometry or veterinary medicine was all the same, then you'd know there is a set ratio of population to that profession. But the truth is there isn't because as I experimented and found out through calculations, there are a lot of people out there who are practicing in areas that don't have sufficient population based upon the model. And I'll say that you can go down in some kinds of populations to 600 to one, or you may have to go up to 4,000 to one in order to find sufficient population per provider. Each profession's different and it's a sliding scale. Now, if you look at some of the large cities, and frankly, I did this in Beverly Hills, San Francisco, and Scars, uh, Scarsdale in New York. So we were trying to figure out, these are places that have just a boatload of providers. But you know, a lot of the providers that were there were telling us confidentially their production and collection figures, and they were doing great. They were doing fantastic. And, and, and you have to step back and say, wait a second, based upon the viability of only how many there are in that area, they shouldn't be able to survive. And if there happens to be 4,000 plus to one, well, they ought to be doing fantastic because there's tremendous demand. That isn't true. They weren't. And in fact, if we had, let's say 100 patients uh, and 10 providers, and you add an 11th provider, does that mean that all of a sudden, the production and collections of those existing practices went down proportionately. And you know what we found, Mike? What? What did you find? It doesn't go down, okay? And that's because not all doctors are managing their practices the same way. Not all patient bases are the same. And so you have to look for certain indicators as to why some places are more successful in providing higher income for the providers than not. And it doesn't have to do with the income threshold of the patient base. In other words, if everybody's rich in an area, it doesn't mean that everybody's making more money there. So doctors, if you think for a second that going to an area of a bunch of rich people is going to make your fortune, sorry, it doesn't work. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to get into this and we're going to actually talk about it over three of these sessions. I don't want to take too much because I know, Mike, you've got some things you want to share today, too. But I'm going to kind of get into this PowerPoint. I know I look like a grandpa every time I do this. Uh, hang on. Don't go away. I say speak like a grandpa. Two more weeks and we're having another granddaughter, you know? Oh, okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Her name will be Lily, and I'll show you pictures. Okay. Let's just start from the beginning. Now, the tr traditional manners of evaluating the practices for viability. Most of our competitors, Mike, are doing these weird calculations and I'm still surprised they're using my algorithms. All right, I'm not bitter. I didn't get a check or acknowledgement, but that's all right. So we're gonna answer the question in these next three weeks over is there room for one more? This is the notion of an optimum. Now, the busyness crisis is why we, we started this. We found that the relationship between how many providers and how busy people were often depended more upon the personality of the doctor, proximity of the population to the office, and the, the psychographic characteristics of the population there. So let me just be real quick. The optimum has been interpreted as no competition. So in other words, a lot of people say, hey, I want to go to a place where there's no competitors. That's what I want. Uh, and they want to know, is the area above or below average as to the competition ratio? Now, I kind of get that because knowing that there is some sort of a, a, a more or less is good. But here's the thing I have to remind you. Each profession has a different average. The averages vary as society, professions, and technologies vary. So back in the old days, back in the 80s, people weren't practicing the same way, weren't using the same technologies. And frankly, patient expectations have changed. So that has changed over time, and market uh, conditions often determine the viability. 
So if you look at the three obvious things, like are they rural, suburban, and urban, that in itself is going to determine significantly how viable an area is if you're trying to find an optimum number. I know this is heavy lifting for people who didn't necessarily go into the professions because they love math. Nevertheless, it's true. Now, you may say, what's the difference between rural, suburban, and urban? Well, one of the ham-fisted ways of looking at it is population density. How many people live per square mile? We have found that it will differ in each of those population densities, but there's also other demographic characteristics, like the relationship of the doctor to the patient base. In rural areas, there are fewer people. And you would expect people who are willing to travel further to get to the provider. That is absolutely true. And in a, an urban setting, the exact opposite is true. You better be really close by or forget it. But you see, the way they act and the way they think about each profession has to be different. Now, our competitors, may I point out, may have a ham-fisted way of looking at it, but they never take into account the market conditions of the pop population that they're serving. They don't take into account is this rural, suburban, or urban, or the population density. They may look at other characteristics like income, but they don't really look at it much beyond that. Now, there are a few false assumptions that exist that I just want to kind of go through. One of those false assumptions is no competition is really a great thing. Well, actually, it's a danger sign. When there is no one else practicing in that area, you have to ask yourself, why is no one else here? And very often there's a reason. There is, while an area may have above or below average competition ratios, average does not indicate viability. So just because there are a lot of providers and very few people doesn't mean that those providers aren't making a boatload of money. The average could also mean bad. It ultimately, average or above or below can be part of a negative trend. And ultimately what we're really looking at is what is the trend in the area? Now, doctors, I know I'm talking to you about a level that nobody's ever talked about this with you, but I hope that you're sufficiently grounded in statistics that you understand why that's true. It is not the ratio that's important. It's the type of patient and the market condition that's going to determine your viability. Not all market conditions are trending positive. Now, a lot of people say, oh, rural is the way to go. I want to go to a place where there's very few people per square mile. But, you know, that only works in some market conditions. So, for example, if you go to the Midwest right now, yeah, that works well. If you happen to be in central Utah, it doesn't work so well. If you look at the suburban areas, there are lots of definitions of suburb and transportation accessibility, visibility of the office, and other factors are going to determine how good or bad it is. But for the most part, right now, suburban means good. Urban can be pretty negative because the cost of doing business right now in a suburb, pardon me, in an urban area is of challenge. So that's why if you may be just brilliant and want to go to San Francisco or Seattle, you have to understand you're going to be fighting a lot of trends that are going to hurt you, including how much you're paying your staff. Now, what you really need, you're looking for a desirable type of patient based upon preference and profitability for you. Now, let me just real quickly say, there are a lot of doctors who are making a serious amount of money working with the poor. Yeah, no kidding, the poor, ethnic poor, people who don't speak our language or your language, whatever. And very often, it is not a matter of the ratio that's determining their success, but how well this provider and this practice relates to that patient base. What I, and I wish I had a lot more time, but I'll, I'll discuss this in the future, about how the psychographic characteristics of the population is more important than the demographic characteristics. Type of person is defined by psychographics. A demographic is how old you are, how much money you make, uh, and all those factors. However, psychographics are how your lifestyle is. Are you the kind of person who will go to a doctor? Because, you know, there are people in all income thresholds who won't go. But there are indicators to say what kind of people do go. 
And this is true for veterinarians. So if you're a veterinarian and you happen to have a small animal practice, not everybody is going to bring their pet in for the same reason. They tend to have a different psychographic or a reason why they behave a certain way. Geography is a companion expression of psychographics and demographics. So you see, you don't just say, I just want to find people of this type. You have to say, I want to find people of this type who are in a geographic radius that is close enough that they're willing to make that trip. In clinical demand of messaging, media, even your, your fees, your pricing, are expressions of psychographics. So yeah, is it true that rich people can afford to pay more? Yes, but not all rich people are the same. Some are much more willing to pay more than others. And so what I want to appeal to you doctors who are watching this right now, listen, if you're smart, you'll do research. Yeah, you, you'll want to know the, the ratios. Absolutely. But it isn't enough. You have to know something about the psychographics, the values and their lifestyles to determine if this is a population that is going to meet your needs. Now, we've got tools at Dr. Demographics. The marketing report is probably our best tool to decide what the psychographics are. Real quick, if you happen to be in an area and your production is down and you can't figure out why, nothing really has changed, very often it's the population psychographics that have shifted. Not the number of people, not the number of competitors. That's why the marketing report which we prepare can be so valuable. Telephone consultations can help as well because we can do a little shorthand with you to determine if this is the way to go. The, psych, the best science reports and the practice site viability reports both take into account the psychographics of an area. So look, guys, our competitors aren't doing psychographics. They may do some demographic clustering, it is true, but unless they've explained how the lifestyles are going to affect your production, they're in trouble. So I want you to go to drdemographics.com and take a look at our specials. The Miracle Max 49 is still being used right now as a discount, but it's only offered for those people who are following us here. Now, Mike, anything you want to add to this? Um, brilliant, as always. Thank you. Thank you. And, and the psychographic analysis is such a larger conversation, really. I mean, and, and I really like... You know, it's it's hard not to to talk bad about competitors, and I'm not going to do that. But but you can't oversimplify this stuff. You know what I mean? I mean, I think that's the problem is that we have a lot of people that oversimplify. Just take a, an algorithm or something that you utilized in one situation and what, at what time, one population, and apply that to the whole country. And right. that is very very uh, uh, scary to do and irresponsible, in my opinion, because you're giving out data that's that there's just so many more factors uh, at play. And I, I think that's a, that's an, that's a scary thing to do for doctors to rely on that. And that is why numbers themselves don't ever tell the story. It's the analysis that is really what you're getting. That's right. Of course. Okay. As I'll explain starting next week is there are 65 psychographic groups right now. It went from nine to now 65. I want to tell you about how they're derived, where they came from, and how you can use them. But doctors, if you're going to spend tens of thousands of dollars to purchase a practice or to start up and you're depending upon it, and you don't know the psychographics, you're not very bright. I'm just saying. Yeah, you're crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. Mike, why don't you take it away? Okay, so, so I am going to – I'd like to share a video that I did last week um, in the – Dental Practice Insiders Group, we do what's called Whiteboard Wednesday. And I felt like this topic was pretty relevant. And so it is going to go over time just a touch. So I apologize for that, but just bear with me just for a half second here so that I can share this. And hopefully you're able to get the sound as well. So I'm going to jump right into it. Hey guys, Mike Green here with the Dental Practice Insiders. Welcome to Whiteboard Wednesday. Today we're going to talk about a really important concept 
that if you understand this concept, it's gonna help you better set goals for the appropriate phase of business that you're at. Make sure that you stay in your lane and make sure that the steps that you're making is carrying you through that success path all the way from startup all the way to the profit stage of your practice. Let's get started. Okay, here we go. So this is you right here. This is you little stick figure. And the goal here, you're in the startup phase here, the goal here is to move through the growth phase and be over here in the profit phase. And this little fellow's got holding up lots of money, lots of green money, because he's gonna be very excited about all the monies that he's making in the profit stage. Now we're gonna talk about something a lot today. We're going to be talking about green money and we're gonna talk about red money. And those two concepts are really important to understand because they are tools, right? Money doesn't manage us, we manage money. And whether it's our own money or it's other people's money, meaning our own money is green money and other people's money is, is red money, uh, we're gonna use them as tools at different phases of our business. Now, one thing that you'll notice as we talk about this is I don't have necessarily a timetable for people to move through. The reason for that is because everybody moves through these phases a little bit different and on their own schedule. I have talked to lots of doctors who are 20 years into their practice and they're still operating as if they're a startup. Whereas I've talked to doctors that frankly 12 to 16 months after they buy the practice, they have steamrolled right through this process and they're already well on their way to the profit stage. There's lots of things that go into that. Uh, did you purchase a practice that was already uh, existing? Did you purchase a successful practice? Did you purchase a practice in decline? Uh, was there a lot of hidden gremlins in the practice that you bought that you didn't know that you're having to fight through? Or is it a true startup? And understand that even if you have lots of patients and even revenue coming in, you can still be in the startup phase in the way that you build your business. So let's talk about these different phases, their pros, their cons, well, I should say their, their advantages and the things you have to watch out for when you're in the different phases. So let's first talk about that startup phase of your practice. Now again, that doesn't mean that it's a from scratch practice, it just means that you're in a startup methodology, you're in a startup mindset, you're in a startup phase of your business. Here's some of the features that you can recognize if you are in the startup phase. You have very little green money, meaning that you may be making a lot of revenue, but you're barely making your overhead expenses. You're barely paying for uh, your equipment costs. You're barely paying for those student loans, that practice loan, all those things that you bought that we classify as red money, um, you're, you're kind of being controlled of that. You just don't, at the end of the month, you really don't have a lot to show for it as far as your own green money in your wallet. Now, the one thing is that you usually have lots of red money, meaning that you probably got a loan and you have a lot of capital at your, your disposal right now, meaning that you can buy that you know, new piece of equipment, you can uh, do a facelift on the front of the building, you can repave the parking lot, you can do a lot of those things that will make you kind of the shiny and new practice, which frankly is one of the biggest benefits of being in the startup phase is typically you have the money to make those improvements and you can't appear to the public as the new shiny practice on that side of town. So it can be a really great benefit. Another thing is that you're experiencing a lot of staff churn, meaning that you're hiring somebody, six months later, they're gone. Or you hire somebody and uh, uh, six days later, they're gone, right? You just are having a lot, you feel like all you're doing is, is hiring and interviewing and it's a real headache. And it's one of the most challenging things to do. As a matter of fact, most business owners really 
underestimate the amount of emotional toll and the amount of financial toll it's going to take to find that team. And so if you're experiencing a lot of staff churn in your practice, you're probably in the startup phase yet, meaning that you haven't found that perfect unit that is going to stay with you for the long term. And not everybody stays with you forever, but most practices that are in the profit stage are have team members that have been with them for a very long time, that know the culture, that are a true team member uh, for their practice. So staff churn is something that we see quite a bit. Another thing is just sleepless nights, right? Um, you're worried about, oh my gosh, um, we're not gonna be able to make payroll, or uh, our patient numbers are down, or we're just not having the success that we should be having at this phase of business, or we're bringing in a lot of revenue, but at the end of the month, we just don't have anything left over. If those are the things you're keeping you up at night, you're probably in the startup phase if that is the situation that you find yourself in uh, for your practice. Now, the second step past the startup phase things start looking a little bit better, a little bit more sunny, and that is the growth phase of business, meaning that you are through some of these initial challenges that you have as a practice owner, and now you're starting to see pretty rapid growth. Now, one thing that I'll note, and you see this little shortcut here, a lot of times, a lot of doctors will try to shortcut the challenges of the startup phase and, and buy into the growth phase. Um, for a practice, which works sometimes, right? If you find the right practice at the right deal, that has a good culture, a good team, and that you as the buying doctor also fit in to that culture and that team, and you can continue that practice's growth, meaning that all of a sudden you don't lose 20, 30, 40% of your patients, that can really work. You'll pay for it usually, but it can work and it can, it can help you get through some of this stuff and not have to deal with it at all uh, right off the bat. So that can be a really good thing. Let's talk about some of the features of a growth stage of a practice. First one being that you're starting to see business creating itself. In other words, patients are walking through the door and you have no idea where they came from. They are, uh, you can't really assign them to, it's a marketing that you did, you didn't have to fight tooth and nail to get them through the door, they are just starting to generate themselves. Now, they're generating themselves from marketing typically, but it's usually from patient referrals or your reputation in town. Um, some of those things are just starting to pay some residual benefits and those patients are starting to create themselves into new business and so that, when that starts to happen, um, and not an outlier, not once in the last three months, but is happening multiple times a week, you know that you're entering the growth stage of your practice, and as long as you don't screw it up, that can be really the driver that takes you from growth to profit, and so that's a really important indicator to start seeing happening as quickly as you can in your practice. The second thing is that you start to get pretty predictable marketing, meaning that in the startup phase, you're spending a lot of that red money in trying this, trying that, um, I've been a marketer for 20 years. I will tell you that not the same marketing works in every single market. Usually every single market psychographically is a little bit different. And so you usually have to try different methods before you find that perfect algorithm that's going to work and produce consistently for your practice. And so when you start to get that figured out to say, okay, every time I put a nickel into this, I'm getting back a dime, now you know you're starting to get some predictability for your marketing and you can really scale that at that point. A lot of people try to scale before they really have the predictable results and that's why they end up spending way too much on marketing. So the next thing that happens is they're experiencing what I call the stare pattern in their business. And I've got this kind of written out right here. So essentially what happens, this green uh, line basically represents revenue. So revenue is increasing for your practice. You're seeing that revenue consistently increase month after month or maybe even quarter after quarter. But the black line is essentially your profit. Now, what happens is that you reach a stage where you're becoming very, very profitable as your business, and now you're ready to invest in something, another staff member, a new piece of equipment, a better sign, maybe even a better location sometimes, right? And so you make that investment, and all of a sudden you become less profitable. Um, 
uh, with the practice because you've had to spend that money. But because your revenue continues to increase, you are able to kind of work back through more profitability and then you make an investment, right? And you go up that next level of the stair. You lose a lot of profit, but you're able to gain that back over time because you made a really, really good investment. And so when you start seeing that pattern in your practice come into fruition, you start to understand, okay, we're really moving through the growth stage or the scaling stage of our business and basically you just continue to do this frankly right through the profit stage until either your markets tapped out or frankly you are tapped out as a practice owner so that's happening quite a bit now the next thing is that you're starting to see more green money than red money, meaning that you're maybe paying off some of those initial loans, um, you're not having to rely on going to the bank and getting, getting some red money, other people's money, in order to be able to make those investments, but you're making enough green money, money that you 100% control, and you can make those investments interest-free, or you get to decide, start making your own terms on the red money, and you get to be a really picky chooser for interest rates and the best deal that you're gonna be able to find for that red money, because you're not really desperate for it at that point, like you are when you're in the startup phase. Okay, the next thing is that a lot of doctors choose to sell at this point. Uh, which is totally understandable and is a really good idea to do that when they're at that stage because a lot of times the practice is the most um, marketable at that stage. They can show really consistent growth. They've been investing in new technology and the team is put together. They're not having a lot of uh, team churn and you've got your marketing al algorithms really predictable at that point. It's really a good time to market your practice. So if you were in it for a short-term short flip, now is the time to do it. If you try to do it at this stage, it's gonna be much more difficult and you're probably not gonna get the price uh, that you wanna get. Now, remember, there's practices that are 20 years in that are still at the startup phase, and that's why they have a hard time marketing their practice because they really can't show any of these other great things that are in the growth phase of their practice. So that's why that's so important. Okay, let's talk about that profit stage. So if you decide in your practice you're not gonna sell at the growth stage, or you maybe want to wait a little bit until you're really in control of that green money, you may want to wait until that profit stage. Now that profit stage has a couple of really cool things that happens. The first one is the owner now becomes in the driver's seat. They get to really decide what they're going to do, how they're going to strategize, where they're going to spend their money. They're not having to listen to the bank or investors or anything else. Typically that that owner or that owner group is in full control of what's happening with that practice. And the big thing they're in control of is their red money, frankly. They've got plenty of green money, as we know from this place, they got it through the growth phase, but now they get to really control the red money, and that red money can really become a fantastic tool for you to expand into other markets or to do whatever you want to do for the practice, keep it shiny and new to compete with the startup people, you can do that because you can go out and get the best rates, uh, the best deal on that red money that you'll need in that practice. Or, or you can decide not to take any red money. There's certainly a lot of uh, doctors that have been really savvy through this process and they have enough money to self-fund all the expansion they want to do. And so that's a great goal for some of you younger doctors. Uh, the next thing that happens is that oftentimes they transition from being a clinician to becoming a full-time business owner, meaning that they do not really do any of the technical work. They're not filling a drill and they're not doing any of that stuff. They hire an associate or, or they uh, will bring in a partner or whatever, and they're just playing business at that point, or they're playing fisherman on the beach or whatever they want to do. Why? Because they're in full control. They're in the driver's seat. But typically, we start to see them transition out of some of the clinical work if they want to. I talk to lots of doctors in the profit stage of their business who love the clinical work and want to do it till the day they die. And so again, because they're in full control, they can make that decision to continue to be a clinician for as long as their body will allow them or as long as their mind will let them. So the last thing that we see is that they can sell, they can expand, 
they can build a legacy, they can really do whatever they want at that stage. And so, again, a lot of times we see practices that are in this phase, think, oh, I'm, gonna go, I'm just going to hurry and borrow a bunch of money and make three different satellites in different parts of the country because it's growing. And that's how they end up having uh, some serious financial problems because they don't have some of these other fundamentals in place. So let's talk real briefly about three tips that will help you tra move through this process as quickly as possible. I would say a, a realistic time frame that, that we'd like to see for a healthy practice is to move from the startup phase to the growth phase in about 18 months. If you can do that as a practice, and again, this is a lot market dependent and, and doctor dependent, a lot of those things, but as a general rule, if you can move from growth to startup in about 18 months, I'm sorry, start up to growth in about 18 months, that's where we want to be. Most practices, it'll take maybe about five years for them to get to the point where they're moving through the growth phase and can start to be, become very profitable and start to see some of the benefits of that profit stage of their business. Sometimes it takes a lot longer, sometimes it takes shorter time. Did you come in with a bunch of money? Um, there's lots of factors there that can depend on that. So don't beat yourself up too much if it's taking you longer, but that's kind of a general healthy phase for people to move through those different phases of practice. So let's talk about those tips real quickly. The first tip is to find your marketing rhythm as quickly as possible. That's something that you can do really quickly and will move you through these different phases probably faster than anything else. Again, I go back to that example, as soon as you can put in a nickel and get back a dime, you know that you have a marketing system that works. And so the faster that you figure that out, the quicker you're going to be able to move through this phase because you'll be able to be in full control of how often, how quickly you want to scale. The second thing is make sure that you manage your money and not the other way around. There are a lot of doctors at the late stage of their practice that are still running from the creditors, still running from the banks. Not running from them, but are being totally controlled by them and they are just not in control of their money. So whether you need to raise your financial IQ, you need to get good advice on that, or you just need to make good decisions in these phases, you need to make sure that that's a goal that you're managing your money extremely well really early on. And frankly, if that's not part of who you are and your personality, then maybe you ought to look for a partner or somebody that can help you make those decisions with your money so that you don't have that as a hindrance going forward. And the last one that I think is extremely important and probably undervalued for most practice owners is that you need to get advice from people who have zero invested interest in your practice. Meaning that um, don't get advice from your brother-in-law, don't get advice from your spouse, don't get advice from grandma. Um, even if maybe they put money into the practice, of course they're gonna be telling you a lot of different things, but you need to be getting advice from qualified individuals who are not invested in the success or failure of your practice because they will usually give you the truth. Now, that's not to mean that they don't want to see you be successful and they don't want to do these different things, but I found that you will get a much more honest uh, answer if they're not invested in the practice. So that is the different growth phases. Hopefully that will give you some perspective. All right. Well, thanks for being patient through that. Uh, that's something that we do over at, if you go on Facebook and look at DPI members, that's Dental Practice Insider members, that we do a whiteboard Wednesday every week. And uh, that was the topic that we did last week. I thought that was relevant for this conversation. So thank you for being patient. I know we went over a little bit. It was hard. I, thank you, Scott. I realized that was, that was hard for you to get through. Because that's all, that's all peas and carrots for you. I get it. I get it. You're so far above where rest of us are at. Well, let me just share something real quick with you as, in response to what you were doing. You know, I, I was in getting my, uh, my master's degree in business uh, at Cal State Northridge. And uh, I, I didn't finish that degree. I got really far into it. But the MBA is, a, anyway, it's not like a real degree. Anyway, the point is, what you were really talking about is really marketing, not management. Sure. And unfortunately, you were using a lot of the language of, of management. I'm afraid if people aren't listening carefully, what you're really doing is helping them to grow or transition their practice. Absolutely. And I think ultimately that's the, the trick of what you're doing. And I think it's, it's pretty darn good. Uh, I, I believe, by the way, everybody needs to have that kind of training. Uh, but boy, it sure can take a lot of discipline. And you know, my humble opinion is 
having someone like Mike or other people to help you get through that process is very, very wise because I don't know very many people who can make themselves do it. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. So I think we probably ought to wrap up here and thank everybody for, uh, for listening. I look forward to next week, by the way, which should be a pretty darned important session for us all. And uh, again, thanks so much for watching.